So Kamal Peterson should need no introduction. The Stamps fans are all excited. I see their, uh, their reaction here on Twitter that he's going to be on with us today. Hang on, Kamal. I'm going to read your bio here. 01 to 03 with the Calgary Stampeders, 04 05 with Winnipeg, 05 06 with Hamilton, 07 10 Edmonton, 2011 BC, West Division All Star in 2008, most outstanding Canadian in the CFL in 2008 as well, and now coaching in the Toronto area. He is a Los Angeles product. Mr. Peterson, good morning. How are you? Not too bad. How are you doing, Rod? Really well, real well. I'm excited to have you on the air. However, I was telling the guys, they said, what do you remember your memories of Kamau? I said, him killing the Riders pretty much every time that they played. So, uh, yeah, you were a tough SOB to do business with. But let me ask you this. How is your life amid the pandemic in the Toronto area right? Let's just start there. How are things with you and your family and crew? I've been lucky. Uh, you know, family's all well. You know, everybody's done okay in terms of isolation and, and quarantining. But uh, uh, I think, you know, come to find out in something like this, find out whether you're built for this type of isolation or not. And come to find out, I kind of am. I'm pretty self-sustaining, uh, you know, out here riding it out with my girlfriend out here in, in Toronto, training athletes and, and doing what we normally do, but still trying to respect the social distancing rules and keep up with everything. Well, of course. And as I as I look at you and I read that bio, I'm flooded with questions for you. But but I'll say this. There, there's been a debate raging about, you know, Deron Carter said, this is how pro football players have lived forever, looking over their shoulder, fear of losing their job. And now a lot of people have. Would you say your career in pro football has prepared you to handle this? Uh, you know, I'm a firm believer that whatever you do, along the way prepares you for what's next. So in that regard, yeah, and he's not wrong in that uh, football is unique amongst even the the sports, you know, uh, other alike sports in that without having guaranteed contracts, you could be cut at any time. So that is a very difficult thing to budget for. And um, those who have had 10, 12 years in it, like I have, are, are much more, I guess, unfazed by times like this. Um, than maybe the, the average person. I, I'd agree with that for sure. I said I was flooded with questions. P- p- please tell me how an L.A. guy ends up playing at New Hampshire and then ends up in the CFL, oh. and you were a non-import status, were you not? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the big laugher was that, you know, the, my most outstanding Canadian that I won, I was up against Ben Cahoon and we're sitting there at the table before uh, they call the names and both kind of laughing, having a chuckle at the, you know, the, the, the negative energy we were getting from some fans and that neither of us were actually Canadian. You know, he's from Montana and I'm, you know, raised in the Detroit Windsor area and, and was a U.S. citizen. And But both of us had our first training in Canada. I, I went to high school in Windsor, Ontario and started playing up there. Um, you know, and, and so that was really my first indoctrination into football. And I believe that's still the rule. So I played as a, as a Canadian for, for all those years and was, was fortunate to do so because I certainly had my ups and downs. And I, I genuinely feel like, you know, my rough patch in, in Winnipeg uh, you know, I really feel like it would have ended for me there had I not had non-import status and um, was able to rebound from that and have my best years in Edmonton to follow that. So I'm very grateful for, you know, the, the ride that it's taken me on that non-import status. I love having guys on of your vintage, your age group. Clark, the producer, was saying that you wanted to know what we would talk to you about. You see how there's a lot of things to talk to you about come out. And I, for, for the football people that are watching, of which there are many, G. Roy Simon's watching, by the way. Good morning, G. Roy. Um, is there, for, for, for the scouts and the personnel people, they, they always like to know the answer to this come out. Is there one guy that you would credit for getting you to the CFL that discovered that non-import status? And was it a scout? Was it a GM? How, it was Calgary in 01, obviously. How did that come about? I'll tell you, it's actually, uh, it's, it's, uh, Paul Lapolis. He was, um, our connection was through New Hampshire. He was leaving university of New Hampshire. He was the receivers coach when I was coming down on my visit. So he had just shifted to, I want to say Toronto, or maybe he had a stop in between, but he actually drove me to the airport from my recruiting visit and started talking to me a bit about the CFL. I, I hadn't been that in tune with it as a high schooler, um, but started paying more attention. And then sure enough, when it came time, uh, when my four years was up, I still wasn't paying attention to the CFL. I was working for my pro day and 
uh, getting ready for the combine and, and getting ready for the NFL side of things as, as most American players in the D1 level do. Um, and he called me up. Uh, he was with Toronto at the time and just, you know, let me know that I was eligible for the combine and would I like to go and started that process with my coaches. And sure enough, I, I, I didn't want to close any doors. So I went down there and uh, funny story, they, they send you, um, you know, kind of a, a guideline of what you should bring. And, uh, you know, your pads and helmet are in it. And I had never seen a combine that would require pads and helmets. So I thought they were joking. So I didn't bring pads or a helmet. I, it was in Montreal and I had to uh, borrow a helmet from the Alouettes, but they didn't let me use pads. So I did the one-on-ones without pads. And luckily nobody touched me anyway, so it didn't it didn't matter. But um, that's a, an interesting tidbit from that. But yeah, Paul Apolis for sure is the guy that got me into the into the swing of the league and, and knowing that I had eligibility there and uh, could be considered a Canadian. And then from there, I'm drafted and off we go. That is an amazing story. And Lapo, as you know now, just an absolute CFL treasure and now the head coach of the Ottawa Red Blacks. Now, furthermore, I'm looking at your bio. Every two to three years, you move teams. Please tell me, because you were getting richer contracts every time in free agency. What was the deal with that? <laughs> No, I, I learned very early on. I was fortunate enough to have some really good mentors in the game, you know, with Travis Moore being the first one. Um, then, you know, even in my NFL time, I had guys like Santana Moss and Wayne Krebet and Donald Driver that took me under their wing. And then I go to Winnipeg and got Milt, you know, maybe one of the greatest mentors I had as a professional. And then come to Edmonton, I got Jason Tucker. You know, I go to BC, I got G-Roy. And all these guys have been – you know, I tremendous in sharing wisdom with me. Um, and I'm grateful that I was able to receive it at a time when you're young, you know, in my twenties, you're impetuous, you think you know everything. And and these guys were able to get through to me. And and one of the main things that they they hooked me into was that there's no loyalty in that league or any other pro football league. So to come in with intentions of staying with one team. Uh, can be misguided. In, in our game, you're really a slave to who wants you and when, and they can let, they can change their mind at any time. So it's imperative that you drive that ship in terms of your worth and your value. And you see a lot of athletes doing it now, especially in the NBA. Guys are really calling their own shots and creating their own um, uh, sense of, of worth and, and striking when the iron's hot in terms of their marketability. And uh, uh, so that was instilled in me very early by some key veterans, guys that are pillars in the game and some of the greatest ever, ever do it. Um, and I, that held to me. I was never, you know, never had delusions of, OK, well, I'm going to stick with this team forever. It, it would have been nice if that's who that's what they wanted. But I just didn't work out like that for me. Some guys got that opportunity. But and there was more guys like myself and, you know, Kevin Glenn, maybe probably is the biggest example of that where you got to go where the work is. For sure. And, you know, the cool part is you get to be alumni of a lot of teams. That's the bonus yeah. of you got friends in a lot of places. Now, I got to say this, uh, Kamal, I had a request from a, a PR guy in Toronto today that said, when you have your guests on, ask them their thoughts on their wildest games. So I'm going to ask you, obviously, you'd have a ton. But I, you were with the Eskimos in 07. Were you playing in the infamous blackout game at Taylor Field where the game was delayed for an hour because of the power outage and the storm? You, okay, yep. we get all the riders' side of that. Can I get yours as the visitor? What do you remember about that infamous game, the Blackout Honestly, game? That one in particular, like I've gone through that for some reason. By that point, I'd already gone through that two or three times. I had gone through it in Green Bay at the Hall of Fame game where our game was actually – canceled in the first quarter due to lightning, which is crazy because I needed that to make the team. Um, went through it in Winnipeg, sorry, yeah, in Winnipeg with Calgary in a game that we absolutely needed to win to make the playoffs in the 01 title run where the lights on half the field went out and we had to delay the start of the game. And they were talking about maybe not playing it but or suspending it, but we ended up playing it with half the lights out. Um, but that game in particular, so I was a bit maybe more prepared for it than than most. It, I don't recall it phasing me very much. Um, and we were a pretty well coached team at the time, had a lot of vets. This is, you know, if you remember before the cap era really kicked in heavy. So we had some some older guys on that team still, you know, your AJ Gasses of the world, your Jason Tuckers and, you know, Ricky Rays, Jason Mosses. So the, the pulse of the team was able to remain pretty low beating. Um, you know, we had some young guys on the team as well. I believe that was Calvin McCarty's 
rookie year uh, and you see how long he's had a career since and been able to hold it down. But we, we were a pretty vet laden team. So we were able to stay pretty collected at that time from what I recall, but um, things like that happen, you know, it, it gets to the point that you're in the CFL, you recognize things like that are going to happen. I, I've had games. Remember when the, in the AstroTurf days, I remember playing games in Toronto where there were huge chasms in the turf and they had to alter and fix them in game in order to continue game play. So it wasn't too unique at that time in our league. And, and I'd imagine it's probably still like that in some respects. Did you actually think that we would have nothing to talk about today? I wasn't sure, honestly. I, you know, <laughs> I don't, I'm not one of these guys that laments too much about, uh, you know, my time in the CFL. I, I, I kind of stay moving on to the next thing. The athletes that I work with oftentimes do ask me questions and I, I find that I have to kind of dig into my memory banks to find answers to them, but it's not present in my mind. So I wasn't really sure, you know, I know you guys talk CFL all the time, but it's, a, it seems like such a different game than what I played. Um, I almost feel detached from it at a time. So, you know, I should have known you to come up with something we could talk about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I'm obviously teasing, of course, but I mean, we all CFL fans remember you and I just from a rider perspective, a ratio breaker, in some ways, a matchup nightmare and just a hell of a hell of a career. Now, you mentioned the players that you're dealing with now. You've been coaching for some time at York. Tell us about your role in the game now, if you don't mind. Um, I had six years at York. I actually just finished up my time there um, this February and, and had a, a, a great time there in terms of the athletes that I got to work with, was able to build some tremendous young men and, and help them achieve their dreams and, and put some of them into that league. Uh, you know, some CFLers, guys like Nikola Kalinich and Colton Hunchak and Jacob Janke and uh, a great crop of guys that are going to be hopefully coming up in this draft. Um, but so for me, you know, I went from coaching on Team Canada and uh, it, it, that was my intro, indoctrination into coaching, and that was 2012. So from there all the way through to York, that was really my first opportunities to coach the game, aside from training athletes, which I've done since 2002. Um, but really starting to tackle the X's and O's, and you know, I got to be the coordinator there for three years or so and really call the shots and, and build a, a collective of players. So it was a great experience for me, great opportunity to, to learn from some of these young guys and, and mentor them on on their way. And uh, so for me now, it's on to the next thing, but I still maintain a, a great relationship with a great number of those players. So I've been really fortunate to be able to um, have an opportunity to put hands on uh, and, and build up a lot of what is now the league or, or aspiring to be the league uh, that I played in, which, you know, for me was always, always the goal. I've always been a, a builder and teacher in, in all things. And, and football happens to be the thing that I was able to do the longest and achieve maybe the most mastery and specifically pass game and receiver work. So I'm able to pass that on um, often and I'm still doing so. Well, good for you, man. And that's, uh, I, I might have interviewed you, interviewed you a couple times. I don't think we ever actually shook hands and now we can't, but I know a lot of guys that, that know you and they say nothing but great things. So I just wanted to tell you that uh, you obviously made your mark, not forgotten. And Kamal has been awesome today just catching up with you. I appreciate it. Appreciate that. And, and uh, thanks so much for the invite. And, and obviously, great job with what you're doing and, and keep it up. Thank you. Stay safe, Kamal. You too. All right, Kamal Peterson joining us as we welcome back in Darren DuPont yes. here. And uh, ho, 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 ho. don't you just think, here's a guy living in Toronto. Wouldn't you want to invite him down to games? Have him hang out at BMO? He's got a potential Hall of Fame career here. Oh, yeah. Grey Cup champion, most outstanding Canadian in 2008, and he's sitting there coaching kids in Toronto going, I feel detached from the CFL. Should be celebrated. <laughs> and that's what the, what's, what, what's great about the show. I'm not blaming anybody. It's just a little bit of the CFLs, just the way that it, that it is, right? I mean... You sit here, and what did you say? That Eagle Keys and Ron Lancaster would go to Milestone and sell season tickets? My Dale was the story, but... Okay, yeah. so My Dale. They'd go out there... Probably and stopped at Milestone <laughs> on the way, I would Exactly. Think, right? Set up a folding table and, and let fans come up and sell tickets. You wouldn't see that in the NFL. So they're so accessible. Everything's so close. And so uh, it almost feels ordinary, right? And so then we continue to have that ordinary feeling about them after they're gone and they should be celebrated. They should be put on a little bit of a pedestal because you want to connect the old and the new and, and use guys like that who were such instrumental parts of, you know, my 
growing up with the game and falling in love with the game. He was one of the public enemy number ones on the other side, right along with Nick Lewis, right in Calgary. Those guys should be celebrated. They're doing a great job to grow the game, and they're they're Hall of Famers. Uh, Landon Andre writes in on the Facebook feed. He says, I literally thank God for this show. I hate to even think about what life was like before the Rod Peterson show. Hashtag P1 for life. Thank you, Landon. I literally thank God for this show every day, too. It's just so much fun. It really is. Can we get something for this guy? Can we get him something? That's a great comment. Yeah. Clark, you want to get some info from him? We got something? Nah. Yeah. <laughs> Clark's like, no. Yeah, of course. Let's get this guy something. I like it. Maybe a mug, maybe a shirt. We got any shirts left? Well, yeah. RodPetersonShop.com. But I just, I, I don't know. Um, I try to just market this show and promote this show now because <laughs> it's been made clear the other leagues and teams have people to do that. So that's cool. But I remember the day the Pats were sold, which is my favorite. And I'm just checking to see if Mark and Michelle of the Eagles is logged in yet. He has. Okay. The day of the news conference, when they shifted, it was all the former Pats were down. And I'm talking former coaches, former players, former trainers, former everybody was at that news conference. I'm like, this is awesome. And for a while, f- with the games after that, they were showing up too. The Barry Traps and the Dale Durkatches and the Norm Fongs, those kind of guys. Over time, that dissipated, unfortunately. But I remember walking around the rink going, this is like the Leafs. CFL can do that. Here's a guy, Kamal Peterson, sitting in Toronto doing, not doing nothing, but with regards to being an ambassador for the CFL. I, I, just, I just don't get it. Should be, yeah. Uh, excited for this interview, as are all the Stamps fans, by the way. They've made it be known. What a great Stamps alumni day. Kamal Peterson, Mark and Michelle, and Charleston Hughes all on the program today. Uh, Mark and coming up next after this break. It's the Rod Peterson Show Facebook Live coming this spring to Game Plus Network. And listen live at rodpeterson.com. You're watching Rod Peterson On Demand. For more of the Rod Peterson Show, visit rodpeterson.com or follow Rod Peterson on social media. 